Go ahead and have a seat. And if you would, grab your Bible and open it to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We've been talking, now this is week 5 of 6. We've been looking at six uh, shifts in the way that we think about church and even in the way that uh, we think about how we live our Christian life. Six shifts, and they, they, they're taking us up to, to today where we talk about less programs and more mission fields. And one of the things that we talk about, in, 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 at least from the church leadership standpoint, is what program should we have? How should we have this? What should we do here? Have you ever been a part of something if you thought, man, if we just had a better this program, or if we just, we just had this figured out, it would be better. But if we go back to Scripture, we're going to see a little, different, a little different look at the way that we should be thinking about church. And as we step back and if we look through what we've seen so far in Ephesians, we've seen that it's God's plan to fill the earth with Jesus, and He's going to do that by sending a church. Uh, the church at different times in our history has been in higher esteem, has been leaned on more. But I will tell you this, there has never been a moment in our history where the church of Jesus Christ has been needed more than it is right now. God doesn't have a plan B because he's God. Plan A is to send the church and to bring Jesus. What, what's needed? The church how are we going to, or what's needed is Jesus, how are we going to do it? He sends the church. So that's his plan. And it, we looked a couple weeks ago then at the incredible length of God's love. When we think about this in like spatial terms, the, the length of God's love, the God who is forever glorified in heaven, leaving that and becoming a man just to come, to come and to live a life that you and I would refuse to live so that he could die a death that we deserved. That's how, how long He loves us and how wide He loves us. When, when we tend to think about God's love, we think of us. But I'm going to tell you this. Every person you've ever met, God loves them. Every person, no matter what uh, struggle or background or how different they may be than you, God's love for them fills Him. And that's an amazing, that changes the way that we see people around us. But not only how wide is it, how high is it, 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 it goes to heaven even today. We find that, that Jesus loves you in heaven right now. It's not one of those deals where it's like, oh, I forgot all about him back there. No, he's praying to the Father for us right now. It says he always lives to intercede for them. And how deep is his love? Think of those darkest spots of your heart, the spots that you don't like to talk about, those spots where you go, man, if they only, if they only knew. Do you have one of those areas in your house? For me right now, it's my garage where, you know, the rest of the house looks good, but the garage is pretty funky. You know, that one room where you're like, hey, ain't nobody gets, if, if, if guests come over, nobody gets to go there. <laughs> well, the reality is we have those portions in our hearts as well. God loves that too. And he's sufficient to change that as well. So as we even look at this incredible love of Christ, we see that it's so much bigger and so much more wonderful than anything that we can imagine. And then he brings these people together and he puts folks throughout us, some that are, are willing to go and willing to, to push and some that are willing to speak uh, the truth of God's word uh, down and some who are, are willing to go out and who are, he's just gifted with the ability to tell folks about his son and some who come around those who are sick, the shepherds, and this, those that he provides to teach his word. And what we call that is the church. That's this place where Jesus' love is put on, uh, or this people where Jesus' love is put on display. So today as we get into this, what we're going to see is the church doesn't need as many programs as what it needs is to, to learn to see mission fields. As I was thinking about this, I, I, I grew up, uh, Sunday morning you put on your very best. 
You know, it was, it was called your Sunday morning best. And, you know, here I was this, this little guy that was just rebelling with everything that I had because I did not want to wear that clip on tie because those were, you know, designed by Satan himself. So I was wearing stuff that I wasn't ever going to wear uh, anywhere else. I've got this terrible clip on tie on. And, and, I, I, and I go, and here's, here's how I grew up. You know, uh, I, I went to church and I knew, <laughs> I, with my dad being here, I'm going to be cautious how I say this, but I knew you didn't act up in church. You know, I'd be a fool at home, but when I got to church, I better have my ducks in a row. And that's just going to be the way it is. I'm going to look good, and I'm going to act good. In other words, I'm going to present something that's really not me at all. And while I do appreciate, and it, those don't, don't, don't take what I said wrong, I do. I, I know that um, my prayers that Thrive would be a place where if folks want to wear a suit, that's awesome. And if folks want to wear blue jeans, that's awesome. And as long as we're coming together and worshiping and not, you know, hey, why aren't you doing this or why are you doing this? No, 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 no. This is going to be a place where, where, where we worship Jesus together. But what I found out for me is that I was putting on something that didn't really match the inside all that well. And I, I, was, I was putting on a face. Have, have you ever been there where you went to church and you're like, I'm just gonna, I, I, I'm gonna make it look like I've got everything held together, but really inside, I'm just falling apart. And and that'll come out because you'll hear people say at times, and I know you've heard this. You'll say, Well, the church is filled with nothing but hypocrites. And I always say, Oh, don't worry about that. We've got room for one more. You know, <laughs> you can come too. We we we've got room for that as well. So hey, look, keep that in the back of your mind. As we step into Ephesians 5, Paul is going to rewrite uh, sort of the way that we see things. As he challenges us, now remember, where's Paul at when he's writing this? He's in prison, right? He's, he's, on, he's under house arrest. He's under house arrest, and he's writing a letter to a church that, that, that he loves, a church that's a long way away. And as a matter of fact, this church today would have, would have been in, in Turkey. And he's writing this letter, and he's saying, here, you need to know this. You need to, you need to get this right. With that in mind, Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. Let, let, let me get theological for a second. We, we, we talk about the love of God. Uh, for there to be a love, there has to be an object, right? Something that is loved. Whenever we talk about the love of God, the primary object of the Father's love is the Son. Whenever you read, it's, it's Jesus. And when you and I, by faith, come to trust Jesus, we get brought into the Father's love. Not, not just that He loves everybody, but that His love is focused on you, not something you deserved, not something you've earned, something that was given to you because of the shed blood of Jesus. And it's not just that. It's not that you get to visit and, and live in that. You become part of the family. You become adopted into the family. Your name changes, your life changes, your future changes. Everything that even that you would think of of present day adoption happens as we come to, to know Jesus as Lord. Paul says, now that you're his kids, imitate, be, be like God. And I was, I was riding in a car with a buddy of mine yesterday and he's telling me this story about his grandson. And his grandson, who's only like two years old, and they're going to a birthday party. And out, his two-year-old, out of the blue, goes, oh, dang, I forgot to pick up a birthday card. <laughs> and you, you listen to that, and you go, hang on, what's he doing? He's imitating what he's heard. He's imitating that, the, 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 the people around him. And here's the thing. As Christians, our task is to imitate God to imitate the love and, 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 and help. And, and, and you go, okay, so what's it mean to, to imitate God? Does that mean I get to judge the wicked? Um, no. No, that, that, that's much 
That needs to be in much safer hands than, you, than yours or mine, honestly. But here, here's, here's the thing. If, if you want to see what God is like, look at Jesus. He's the perfect representation. So you say, well, if I'm supposed to imitate God, who should, who should I imitate? Look at Jesus. If you want to see what the Father's like, if you want to see what the, the heart of God the Father is like, if you want to see how he would respond to things, look at Jesus. Walk in love as God loved us, is what Paul's saying. He, he, he's saying that as we go out, love, love for people should be the primary motivating factor that we have. And it's a, it's a costly love. We, we tend to, I, I say love's a junk drawer word. You, you got a junk drawer in your house, right, where you just throw everything in there? Love, 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 is, a, love is a junk drawer word. In other words, I, I, I can prove it. I love my wife, I love my dog, and I love hot wings. Surely I don't mean the same thing with each one of those, right? Sure, surely there's something different. If not, I've got some real heart issues that need to be dealt with. When we talk about love and God and the, the love that God has for us, we're not talking about an emotion. Yes, there is an emotion there, but we're talking about a commitment to do whatever it takes for the good of that person. Why does Jesus go to the cross? Because he loves you so much and he is so committed that he's willing to do whatever it takes so that you and I can be free. He says, Paul's saying, hey, church, love folks. Be willing to do what it takes. Love people. Uh, be imitators of God. You see, this together is what he's saying. Is a, it's, it's an offering. It's a beautiful offering to God. And then he gives it, and we're not going to have a lot of time here, so I'm just going gonna, gonna to skip over, but he gives this vice list, this, these things to, to avoid. He's talking about sexual immorality and impurity and greed. And here, we need to just say this. It doesn't have any business in the church. It doesn't have any business in the church. We know what's right. God, God demonstrates what's right. It comes down to this. How we live as the church matters. How we live matters. Uh, even last night, uh, we were watching a movie, and, and I, I was thankful that it wasn't me, but it was, it, was just, it was me and Tracy and Jake were all watching this, and finally got to the point where it just had enough. And we're like, hey, this isn't, this isn't right. Let's, let's just get rid of this because it's not going to lead anywhere good. How you live matters. Look at, look at verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty arguments, for God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. Therefore, don't become, or do not become their partners. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it's shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by the light is made visible. For what makes everything visible is light. Therefore it is said, get up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will, will, will shine on you. Paul starts off here and he says, hey, don't let anyone fool you. God's wrath is real. And I'll just say this. I, I know we don't like to talk about wrath these days, but I, the fact of the matter, it is real. I don't want anything to do with it. And I'm thankful that I've got a great Savior who took that for me. I'm thankful that we have Jesus. Now, now folks will, will go, if Jesus has paid it all, right, and all to him I owe, why do I need to worry about that? And let me talk to you for just a moment about cheap grace. If indeed Jesus has paid the price and he's taken that sin, and my sin was so heinous to God that he had to send his son to step in on my behalf, then I've got no business walking in it. The Christian doesn't avoid sin 
because of a fear of retribution. Jesus has already paid that. The Christian avoids sin because it is offensive to the God that loves us. Amen. It's offensive to the Father, so I'm not going to have anything to do with it. Th think about it like this. If, if you're a parent, do you, want your, do you want your kids to do what is right because they don't want a spanking or a grounding, or do you want them to do what's right because they know your heart? Think of sin in that way. Think of sin in that way. We don't, we don't do these things. I'm not going to walk down this road. I'm going to avoid it, and sometimes I'm just going to turn the TV off because we know it's offensive to God. Okay, enough on that right now. Since we're bound to Christ, our, our lives should look different. What he's not saying don't, don't miss this. What he's not saying is separation because oftentimes it's easy for, for the church for us to say, well, you know what? I'm going to separate from the world. If I completely separate from the world and I don't have any interaction with the world, then I don't have to worry about that. Well, I'm going to tell you this. If we separate from the world and we try to hide and we have no interaction, how in the world are we ever going to tell folks who, who don't know Jesus? How are we ever going to demonstrate be in the world, but not of the world. We go and we live our lives out with folks who don't know Jesus as Lord so that we can display His love. What He's saying is this, how you live as a church matters. And if you notice here in this text, it, it, sometimes when you read Paul, it, it, it gets difficult because you, you think, man, he's saying the same thing over and over and over again. And if you were careful there, he said darkness twice and light five different times. So what he's doing here is he's contrasting, he's contrasting darkness and light, goodness and being, uh, uh, being with Christ and being apart from Christ. Darkness here represents uh, those who, including us, were once apart from Christ. Matthew 4, 16, the people who live in darkness have seen a great light. Uh, Luke 1, 79, to shine on those who live in darkness in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes uh, so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. And there's, there's the bottom line of it. Darkness... Satan, light here is with Christ. You, you see what, what, what he's doing here. Darkness would be apart from Christ. And he says this. Notice he didn't say you were in darkness. He said you were darkness. It turns out that my sin and your sin is a whole lot bigger deal than what we thought. The things that I let hang out in my heart are a whole lot bigger deal than what I thought. We were darkness apart from Christ. And it's just like me going to church on Sunday morning and getting all gussied up and trying to act my best. I could put on a front, but at the bottom of it all, there was something that was very distant from Jesus. I've been to, uh, have you ever been to Vegas? Vegas is one of those just fascinating places to me because it's, it's so incredible. But Tracy and I had to go out there for a conference. We're walking around, and I'm looking at these huge buildings, and I go, just think, every bit of this is built on someone's losings. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's amazing, and there, it's, you know, it's all lit up, and it's beautiful. And don't kid yourself, it is beautiful. But underneath it all, there's something very unhealthy. Look at the cards that lay on the street. There's something unhealthy. And if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. You see, we can look one way, but underneath have something different. And that is what it looks like even when I'm coming to church and acting like I've got my life all together. But in reality, I'm a long way away from Christ. He says, but because, because of Christ, because of Christ, we're light. So we should live as children of light. Hear me on this for a second. Because here's my experience, and I've faked it a, 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 a long time. I, I, I grew up knowing what was right, but living something different. And I could come to church and put on, put on a show and make you think that I had it together. As a matter of fact, I could probably quite, uh, quote quite a few Bible verses to back it up. But in reality, there was something different going on underneath. The church of Jesus Christ should not live in segmented lives. 
We shouldn't live in, here I've got this face and this face and this face and this face. Uh, way back in the day in, 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 in Rome, actors would change parts and you would hold up a, a face. And it, you, you see when you go to the movie theaters, you see the two masks? That, that's what those mean. Do you, do you know what those are called? Yeah, well, comedy and tra- tragedy or the hypocrite's mask. That's exactly what, what, what they are. So since you would have to change, we got to be the hypocrite as you played. And I can play that as well as anybody. And I bet you can too. And here's the thing. The church of Jesus should be who we are regardless if we're here at Sunday or if you're at work or if you're at home or if you're on the ball diamond or if you're at school. It doesn't matter who we are is who we are. And when we do that, when we do that, church becomes something entirely different. And see, and get this, get this, get this. This isn't something you have to generate. Because when you come to Jesus as Lord, you, you leave that realm of darkness and step into light. In other words, that light gets placed in you. It's not something you make. It's something that he provides. If he provides it, you've just got to do that. What's that, that song? I, I almost thought about singing this song, but I sing so bad that I, I chose not to. But what do, we, what, what do we teach kids when they're little bitty? This little light of mine. Amen. Yeah, I'm going to let it shine. And I had that even written into, we were dealing with some uh, uh, recordings of the, of the service a couple of weeks ago, and I actually heard myself coming through there, and I was like, oh. Oh my goodness, I sing terrible. There's no way I'm going to subject these people to that. But we weren't lying when we taught kids to sing that. And at some point, we've decided that, no, I'll put on this light here, but then change when I get home. We don't need more programs. We need to start to see our homes as mission fields. Paul says there's three ways here that this light displays itself. Here in this text, he says three ways. And uh, um, three ways, you, you'll see it, it'll say all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Well, the, the nerd in me needs to remind it that the all represents goodness, righteousness, and truth. So you could read it this way, all goodness, all righteousness, and all truth. Goodness here in the text has to do with, uh, 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 he's already said it in chapter 2, he said, good works that he prepared for us to do in advance. In other words, and, he, and I'm, I'm going to step on toes here in a second, because oftentimes we, we say, man, I just got to get out of this situation, or I've got to get here, or I, I've got to get here. And the first question I want to ask is, are you doing what God's asked you to do there already? There are times to get out of scenarios, make no mistake about that. But oftentimes it could be that God has placed us in a scenario in order to be his light there. To be that light where he has us. And this goodness, all goodness, these are the things that he has planned for us to do. All righteousness. Righteousness is, um, I, I, let, let's, let's keep this real simple. Doing what's right in God's eyes. You see, when, when you come to faith, let's put some words to this. When you come to faith and Jesus washes away hell and guarantees eternity and says he'll come to live with you forever, we, we call, that's, the technical term is justification. So justification happens when you come to faith. And then if, if his, your heart is going to be his own, he comes in and starts moving stuff around. So, you know, hey, this doesn't belong here. You've got to get rid of this furniture. It's sort of like when you get married and your wife's like, hey, the elk antlers aren't going over the garage. And you're like, oh, yeah, they are. And she's going, oh, no, they're not. Expect Christ to do that in your life. Amen. Expect him to go, that doesn't have any business here. Cut it out. We're going to get rid of that. We've got to do that. And as you grow in Christ, it, it, that process never really changes. It does move, hopefully, to where he's not throwing so much out, but it's more along the lines of just moving stuff around. And the, the technical term for that is sanctification. He sanctifies us. You'll see that if you read, you read your scriptures. And then, as a result of that, we begin to live in ways that are pleasing to him. That's what he says, all righteousness here. So all goodness, all righteousness, and all truth. Truth 
is the opposite of hypocrisy. Back to those tragedy masks again. It's the opposite of putting on a mask. Truth, if we're going to live the truth of Christ, you live Christ's truth on Tuesday afternoon and on Wednesday morning and Thursday when that teacher gives you a hard time and Friday when your boss is being a jerk so that we become the person that God has us to be in every sphere. And I'm not putting on a front. I'm not putting on something fake. I'm not being a hypocrite. I remember working with a guy uh, a number of years ago, and it used to just drive me nuts because he, his work presence, he kept a Bible on his desk. I wasn't working in a church at this time, so don't, don't go, man, I was a minister. No, uh, I, he kept a Bible on his desk and, and, and used it as a conversation start, starter, but everything about his demeanor and his vocabulary and his work ethic screamed the opposite of Christianity. And, and I, I, I wanted to say, as a matter of fact, I think I did say, uh, hey, I, I don't care what you do here, but put, put that away. Don't, don't keep that out here because that's not what you're representing right now. There's a difference. And well, if you want to keep that out, start to work along those kinds of lines. We have to be the same people. Over and over, I, I read a, a, this past week a tribute that a minister had written to his father, who was a minister who's, who, who's been gone quite a while at this point, and he wrote a tribute to his dad because of his dad's consistency. He was like, the thing that I appreciate the most is that my dad in the pulpit and my dad in the backyard were the very same person. And I thought, man, what a, what a gift. What happens, church? Let, let, let me just step on your toes for a minute and step on my own toes here because God's been working on me on this. What happens if we stop playing church and we start being the people that he's called us to be? And then when I'm in home dealing with my kids, that I'm the same guy that I am here. And that when, when I'm welcoming folks with a smile and a handshake, I'm the same person on Tuesday afternoon. What's that look like in your world? All goodness, all righteousness, all truth. This, this idea, I, 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 let's, let's drill this in here, because this idea that we would be the people that God would have us to be in, in, not only here when we come together, but in our homes and where we work and where we play and where we learn, whatever that is for you, that we would be there. If we're going to be that We've got to, we don't have to worry about programming things to death here because we'll become the church in the neighborhoods and we'll be the church in our families and we'll be the church in our workplaces. Would, would you put that picture up here? I, I came across this. This is a picture of NASA. It's uh, clearly uh, the U.S. From, from, from outer space. And you see where the bits of light is. Let, let me boil this down. This is, in essence, what Thrive Church is all about. Everything that we hope to do is represented on this picture here. We want to put light everywhere where there's darkness. The goal isn't to build more and more programs and more and more buildings and more and more structure. The goal is to put light where there's darkness. And that would be in our homes and in our workplaces where, we, where you play ball, if you're at, 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 at band practice, I don't know, whatever it is for you. This is the essence of what we're trying to do. And I'm going to promise you this, if you and I will take this individually, because we'll never be more collectively than we are as individuals. Grandparents in the room, be that model of consistency. Be that model of love and grace. Parents, students, doesn't matter where you're at, remember, God has planned for us in advance good works for us to do. That's the essence of what we're doing, and that means I've got to be serious, not just on Sunday morning, but on Wednesday afternoon. 
And that needs to come through in your life as well. And as we do that, as we do that, we'll become the church that he has us to be. And what happens is, is these spots of darkness in, in our neighborhoods, in our homes, they start to be replaced with light. And they start to be replaced with love. And what happens is you see families get put back together. And you see addiction get laid to the side. And you see sin get replaced with holiness. And you see separation get replaced with unity. Because that's what God always does. He's always good. Paul ends this, uh, th th this little portion here. I'm going to, don't, don't go to 15 yet. Remember he said, wake up, sleeper. And the light of Christ will shine on you. The, the, it, it's funny, is that verse really doesn't, he's quoting something, but it doesn't ever really show up anywhere in the Old Testament. What they're assuming he's doing is putting different verses together. It's sort of that picture of Jonah. Remember when, when Jonah got caught in the storm and everyone goes, hey, wake up, there's something going on. Paul's saying that to the church. In, in Isaiah 61 and 62, you'll, you'll read him saying, wake up, church. God's doing something big here. And that's this idea that Paul's trying to communicate. So now, let's hit verse 15, and I'll start to wrap this up. Pay careful attention then to how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. Don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. We have to get serious about this, making the most of today, making the most of the time that God has given us. I, 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 I was talking with someone the other day, and he was telling a story about a tragedy. I was uh, someone I really didn't know, but it suddenly it, it hit me that I knew the person he was talking about. And it just got my mind going of all the spots through, through my life where God had me in places where I could have shown love and I could have shown help and I didn't. What's the one thing I can't do? I can't go backwards, but I can start where I'm at today and I can determine to be the person that God's made me to be now. Time isn't something that's promised. A couple of days ago, uh, um, there, there was a, a young man by the name of J.J. Uh, Altabelli. He, he's, he's a... He's a scout for the Boston Red Sox. He went to throw out, had to throw out the first pitch at, at a college baseball game. College baseball game was uh, Orange County, Orange County College. He's, his dad was the head coach there. His dad and his mom and his little sister all went down in that helicopter crash that had Kobe Bryant. And it struck me as I'm watching this and, and, and I'm going, man, We've got to make the most of the time that God gives us. Because he never promised me tomorrow. But there's people in my life where I can love today. And there's places where I can shine his light today. There's young folks in my life that, that, that I need to, to get a little uh, more involved with today. You see, when the church does that, the church is on mission and the church is on target for what God has designed for us. That includes you, that includes me. Let's pray.